that we're going to get started. Okay. All right. So um, welcome everyone to our first spring conference for Women in IR 2022. This is our gender and economics panel. Um, economic theory has significantly influenced global policy throughout history since Adam Smith helped begin what is known as the field of modern economics. However, the important and diverse role women play in economics have historically gone largely unnoticed. The gendered effects of economics, how the economy specifically affects women and intersectional research in the field have all been neglected. However, in the past decades, the emergence of feminist economics and push for greater attention on the effects of gender in economics has redefined the world of economics. Today, we are joined by three amazing economists to discuss gender and economics, Joyce Jacobson, Drusilla Barker, and Julie Nelson. Joyce Jacobson is the Andrews Professor of Economics at Wesleyan University and is currently the first woman president of Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. Her research focuses on the economics of gender, including patterns of workforce, sex segregation, migration, and the effects of interrupted work experience on women's earnings and advancement. Her publications include Advanced Introduction to Feminist Economics, The Economics of Gender and Labor Markets and Employment Relationships. Jacobson has been a strong leader in the field. And in 2021, she was awarded the Carolyn Shaw Bell Award for furthering the status of women in the economics profession. Drusilla Barker is a professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Women's and Gender Studies program. Self-identified as a Marxist feminist economist, her research has followed the nature of labor, the importance of gender and intersectionality in economics, and the role of debt as cause of inequality on both individual and institutional levels. Her work can be found in numerous publications, including Liberating Economics, A Feminist Perspective on Families, Work and Globalization, and Feminist Economics Critical Concepts. Julie Nelson is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and is a senior research fellow here at Tufts University. Nelson has also previously held a position in the US Bureau of Labor Statistics as a research economist. And Nelson's research interests include feminist economics, ethics and economics, and the empirical study of individual and household behavior. She's the author of Economics for Humans and has recently published a paper called Economics and Community Knowledge Making. To begin, we wanted to just uh, start off with the first question of what is feminist economics in your words? <laughs> Who wants to try that one first? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try it. Let me try to do that. Um, I wrote a book about a year ago called Advanced Introduction to Feminist Economics. And the idea was to write a short book that would really try to introduce feminist economics to a wider group of people. I think sometimes often in subgroups in economics, you end up kind of talking to each other. And I tried to write it so that, um, for instance, a student who'd had just an intro course in economics could pick it up and read it. So at the beginning, I give a short answer of what it is, and then the rest of the book gives the longer version. So I say that feminist economics calls for inclusive inquiry in terms of both topics studied and who studies them. It turns a critical and gender aware eye on the field of economics, as well as on how real world economies function. It attends to understudy topics, often those considered feminine topics, such as how households operate internally. It considers how standard economics is not truly objective, showing how standard economic models and methods may be biased towards masculine focused outcomes. It emphasizes human and systems interconnectivity rather than independence and reminds us that economics is about both efficiency and equity where equity and the distributional effects of economic policies are often less emphasized by economists than their efficiency. It questions the traditional divide between positive, what is, and normative, what should be in economics without foregoing objectivity. Feminist critiques of the economics project serve in large part to rehumanize economics as a field and remind us that answers, if they're to questions that have become devoid of meaning, are not really answers at all. So that's my definition in the short answer of feminist economics. Um, I'll go next with an even shorter answer. Um, I co edited a book in 1993 about feminist economics and some years later uh, did a survey of some economics departments. And for the survey, we had to define it. So I just looked up what we defined it as. We defined it as including both work concerning women's and men's roles in the economy. That has a liberatory bent. 
So it's not just all uh, work on gender. Um, and critical work concerning possible biases in the focus and methodology of the discipline. So that's our one sentence definition and still my one sentence definition. Well, I'll, go, I'll go third. Um, I agree with what my colleagues have already said. Um, in addition, I would say that feminist economics from a Marxist perspective puts at the front and center uh, the concept of social reproduction. That is to say, how are uh, workers and other people reproduced for participation in the capitalist workforce? And so for me, that is my starting point. And in my latest book, uh, Liberating Economics, second edition, that's very important. It's really different than the first edition. It's basically uh, almost a brand new book and includes the magnificent Suzanne Bergeron, who uh, she and I did the second edition together. Susan Feiner, our other co-author, she has retired now and just sort of didn't really want to do that kind of work, but she's still a co-author and there's still a lot of the work from the first book there. So her name is still on the, on the uh, title. But at any rate, the subtitle says that all families work in globalization. So in addition to social reproduction, I think feminist economics needs to take a global and intersectional approach. That is to say, it has to consider both gender and race and geography and nationality as categories of analysis, rather than as simple objects to be taken as given and plugged in as, as new uh, <clears throat> dependent variables. So that's my definition. Thank you so much. So you guys all mentioned in some form uh, unpaid labor, or like, as you said, social reproduction. Uh, could one of you uh, start with uh, uh, answering the question, in what ways do you think women shape the economy that is not generally acknowledged? Sure, I'll begin that one. Uh, women shape the economy because it is uh, women who undertake the vast amount of social reproduction which as my colleagues know, and we all know is both paid and unpaid. So it has market aspects and non-market aspects. Um, it is uh, uh, absolutely necessary to the running of a capitalist economy and keeping it uh, uh, low paid or unpaid in the case of, of uh, housewives uh, is a, um, a boon for capitalists. It, it keeps their production costs low. But without it, oh, one more thing about that. Uh, and this is not my idea. This, this is uh, in the social reproduction literature. Uh, there's a real contradiction between the capitalist uh, desire for profits and the capitalist need for social reproduction. Those two things are constantly in contradiction to one another. It's kind of like the uh, snake eating its tail. I've always been very taken by um, economist Nancy Fulbray's um, work and in particular her work in really um, fleshing out the term more of caring labor. And I think similar to what Drew is saying that women do the vast majority of caring labor um, which includes uh, social reproduction, but also many forms of not just reproduction, but caring for those who need care, whether they're disabled persons, uh, older persons, young persons, and caring labor has particular drawbacks to those doing it, as Nancy has spelled out, in terms of how you can be kind of captured by those relationships, and in some sense exploited by the very ties of the heart that tie you to the people for who you are performing that labor. That labor then is often done for no money, but also often done for low amounts of money as well, partly because people are reluctant to turn away from that labor um, because it is so necessary and because of those emotional ties. And uh, I'll add a third spin on that, uh, which is you know, feminist economists have looked a lot at 
um, the standard models of economic behavior in orthodox economics. Uh, that's how I was trained, uh, straight sort of uh, neoclassical, and realize that it, it's not a very good description of women, but it's also not a very good description of men, uh, the rational, autonomous, um, self-interested being. Uh, people actually grow up in families. Uh, they get sick, they get old. A lot of the burden of that work, uh, as we mentioned, uh, uh, falls on women. Um, however, I just want to speak up uh, sort of in opposition to uh, na a naive way that sometimes people will take this, which is that there is a masculine economy that's all about uh, self-interest and getting ahead and profit and kind of a feminine soft economy that's all about care. Um, the problem if you think that way is that you let the regular economy uh, go on discriminating against women and uh, destroying uh, the climate and doing all of the other harm it does. And um, you tend to starve the care economy. Uh, the care economy needs resources. Um, the care economy has been treated as though women have nothing else to do. They're just naturally caring, uh, just volunteer to bring up uh, kids and everything else. Um, but I think fathers also love their kids. I think any human being should be interested in uh, survival of future generations. Um, so I argue that we need more resources going to the caring economy where both men and women should participate. Uh, and we need more care in the so-called regular economy uh, where both men and women uh, participate. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Nelson, you mentioned the care economy. Could you go into further detail of how the care economy has shifted from uh, perhaps in the uh, like from the past in the 20th century to the 21st century? Um, if I had the article I co-wrote with Nancy Fulbray in front of me, I could actually give you statistics. Uh, we did a piece that appeared in Journal of Economic Perspective some, some time ago. Uh, that looked at a, a couple of things. One was the shift of, you know, shift of women into the, the labor force, um, you know, meant a, a rise of more marketed childcare services and the rest of this kind of thing. And also shifts within um, the paid economy uh, in uh, advanced industrial economies. Um, and we showed that in fact, the sort of the, um, the picture of the worker, say around 1900, was a man working in a factory. Uh, if we look at the worker now, it's somebody working in a hospital uh, or uh, a school or another service uh, sector. The service sector has grown uh, greatly and those traditional you know, sort of masculine blue collar uh, work um, areas have, have shrunk. Um, you know, with much hardship <laughs> involved. I'm not saying this is, this is all a good thing, but there has been um, a big shift in, uh, and of course, as, as populations age, it gets even more extreme. Uh, Japan is especially facing this, uh, but also the US. Um, you know, people do break down <laughs> over time and somebody needs to, uh, to take care of them as they age. Professor Barker, do you have something to add? Yeah, I would just like to add to that. The other thing that has changed over the years, uh, probably starting in the mid 1970s, is the offshoring of manufacturing from the global north to the global south. And in the global south, the labor force that produces the stuff that we use, our iPhones, our toys, um, basically our clothing uh, is, about 80% women, you know, it, 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 it varies from place to place. And that's a, a, a not a rigorous figure, but it's, it's pretty widely agreed that it, that the, uh, that the factory worker of today is a woman, not a man. And that's, I, I think, as we go through today, I want to um, keep that, that, global south global north distinction somewhat in my mind because the labor that's done in the global south uh, making those inexpensive toys the inexpensive clothing uh, relatively inexpensive depending on what what your income level is uh, as has been one of the things uh, that has helped uh, women in the first world in the United States and Europe to enter the labor force, both in the service economy, as Julie has said, and, and she's absolutely right in terms of the United States, and um, also the managerial economy. The, you know, if you look at how, you know, look at the uh, staff of your own college, colleges, it's who are, who are the people that are doing all that clerical work? It's overwhelmingly women. 
Thank you so much. Um, Professor Jacobson, do you have anything to add before I go to the next question? I think they've, they've spelled that one out pretty thoroughly. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, speaking of the Global South, uh, what additional obstacles do women of color face in our economy today? Um, none of us are specialists in that, although I believe all of us have worked on it at, at some point or another. There are some other people that could speak uh, much more uh, knowledgeably. Um, but it certainly is the case of, you know, that the, the, these things are in, uh, um, uh, intersectional, not just, just additive. Uh, that a lot, like a lot of my writing, for example, has concentrated on uh, Western industrial societies and the way that stereotypes of women, meaning white middle-class women, you know, uh, uh, centrally located in those, uh, or considered to be centrally located in those societies uh, are thought of and the way that those stereotypes um, uh, get reinforced. But of course, a lot of those stereotypes never did fit uh, Black women, recent immigrant women, uh, other, other groups. Uh, and there are, um, you know, compounding uh, disadvantages uh, in a lot of this. And I, I don't have, you know, statistics and everything in front of me, uh, again, because I wasn't prepared for this question, but uh, there certainly are uh, issues. One thing that's I've always been fascinated with is the incredible degree of gender segregation in our economy. And it has this intersectional aspect on the gender segregation as well, in terms of thinking where we are accustomed to see um, women of various racial and ethnic groups, as well as men of various racial and ethnic groups, and how much that can be very binding on people. I, I've, I've always just been so interested to see, and it, it can vary by culture, of course, like Drew was saying, um, you know, clerical work in some cultures is more of a woman's job, and other cultures like Pakistan, it's actually more of a men's job. Um, and so it relates partly to how much you can participate in the labor market as a whole. But in a country like ours, where there are many different groups, including even very specific ethnic groups and areas, it is just always fascinating to look at the degree of segregation. For instance, I think if you look at New York, there is a stereotype that nail salons are run by Asian women, often actually by Korean women. Um, and so you get these narrow function areas that are considered appropriate for women, including the intersectional aspect of women of a particular race or ethnicity. And again, as was emphasized earlier, these are very binding on men as well. So there are very specific categories and areas you see men in that also relate to race and ethnicity. And until you kind of look around and see it, you, you just sort of take it for granted, but it can be very binding. And, it, and when people are in fields that they're not normally in, that can be, be very disjointing for other people to see them there, which I think is good. It's good to shake people up and make them start not associating particular occupations or industries with particular types of people. Um, but there is just so much of that going on. And of course, it is clearer that women of color and men of color often are in jobs that are also less economically advantaged. Yeah, yeah I think, I think uh, people of color face an even higher degree of occupational segregation. And I know in my city, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, we have a very, very, very large black population and a fairly large um, middle class, you know, group of middle class professional women. Uh, I know many of them because we have a, a party every year for Anita Hill called the I Believe Anita Hill Party. And uh, it's the one time I get to mix with uh, professional black women and professional white women. It, it started out as a group of women lawyers. And anyway, so there, there, is a, a, there is a lot of that. But on the other hand, when I look at it, and I know this is a very small uh, personal uh, anecdote, but I still think it's good evidence. When I look at my own university and I look at the janitorial staff, it is mainly uh, people of color. It is mainly African-Americans. And when I look at the clerical staff, it is a little more mixed, but I if just off the top of my head estimate, I'd say probably about a quarter of the clerical staff here are uh, women of color and three quarters are white. And so occupational segregation continues to rear its ugly head because uh, white privilege and the uh, denial of white privilege, uh, and, and we're seeing it with all the rules now that you can't teach critical race theory 
in school. Well, critical race theory has never been taught in elementary schools or high schools. Critical race theory is taught in legal uh, uh, law schools and it's uh, a long noble history and the people that talk about it have no idea, but the uh, underlying messages don't make white people uncomfortable. Don't talk about anything that makes white people uncomfortable. And uh, I, I find that really distressing. Thank you so much. Um, speaking of your own personal experiences, could you uh, each talk about what drove you to study economics? I'll start. Two, two reasons. I wanted to know why people, some people were rich and some people were poor. Uh, I, I was very interested in the problem of inequality which I didn't have a name for in those days. That was one, one reason. The other reason uh, was much more pragmatic. Uh, I wanted a job and I wanted to be a professor. And I was fairly certain if I got a PhD in economics, I could get a job and I could be a professor. And then I, once I had a job and had tenure, I could hammer out my career however I wanted. And so that's why I did it. I didn't know what economics was, by the way. I was really shocked my first year at graduate school. I was like, oh no, <laughs> what in the world is all this math? I hate math. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, my, my story is uh, similar to Drew's in the sense that um, I wanted to know why some people were rich and some people were poor and uh, preferably do something about it. Uh, the other thing was that I liked math and I was good at it. Um, but I didn't want to be locked away just doing math or just doing computer science. I also wanted to do something that had more with people. Um, and uh, I took my first economics class, not voluntarily, but because my advisor kind of marched me over to the table and signed me up. Um, I had assumed that, um, that economics was all about business and business was all about self-interest, um, which is what we're taught and which I have come to question quite a lot. Uh, but my undergraduate education was um, geared towards ideas of uh, service. So in my undergraduate education, I did see some idea of how economics could be used. And then like Drew, I got to graduate school and got hit with a wall of mathematics problem sheets um, and a, a huge lack of critical thinking. Uh, but like Drew, I, I barreled through figuring that nobody would. By that time, I, I realized economics needed a feminist critique. And I also realized no one would listen to me unless I got the credentials. Uh, so I did get the, uh, the PhD in economics. I did publish in Econometrica as my first publication, which was nice, you know, uh, dotted all of those, uh, crossed those T's and dotted those I's so that then I could um, talk about what I really wanted to talk about. Well, similar to both Drew and Julie, I was also very interested in um, inequality and also public service. I thought I would eventually become a uh, worked for the federal government and health and human services or something, and also was good at math, but knew I didn't want to be a mathematician. So economics is a good field, I think, for people who are comfortable with mathematics, but don't want it to be the only thing they're doing. And I had not had any in high school. I just signed up for the big intro econ class when I got to college. And I love the fact that it was kind of about everything. It didn't force you to, to narrow down to one area because you can use economic analysis to study so many things. And I love the fact it was about everything and didn't require you to settle in on one. And, and then discovered really that you could study areas that I was interested in, like why do women and men make different amounts of money and work more or less in the labor force. And it was moving into areas that have been considered more sociological or even anthropological. And that, that was something that you could study also, which made it even broader. So just have always enjoyed the breadth of the analytical structure and how you can think about the world around you. You all mentioned a form of autonomy, uh, where whether that be through job or research and uh, wanting to know what inequality was or like why it existed for your reasons for why you started studying economics. Do you have any insight now, decades into your careers about what, like why inequality exists and also um, like, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a really big issue. <laughs> um, I mean, there are a number of reasons. There are ways to model it. There are unfortunately some 
theories that seem sort of like impossibility theorems on ever being able to eradicate it. Um, I, I sort of like Julie and Drew, I think I thought when I got to graduate school after undergrad that they would explain how it all worked and how you could solve problems. And instead, graduate school tends to be a whole bunch of impossibility theorems on why you actually can't do what you want to do and you can't solve it and you can't fully understand people's preferences and you can't make one person better off without making other people worse off in general. So it makes it all much more difficult. Um, that said, I mean, I think there have been many points of progress, so it can be a little depressing sometimes to study um, economics of gender because women are still unequal relative to men. But I do think things have gotten better. Um, I think in some countries work better than others, um, countries that tend to have more social support structures and pull up the bottom uh, and take away more from the top tend to be better for women. Um, so there are things we know from that, um, but there are trade-offs involved in that like everything else, including different levels of unemployment. So I think we know more about it and we know how we could reduce it, but we're not always willing to take the steps to actually do the things that would reduce it. Uh, I'll, I'll go next. I'll probably be in that sort of in the middle between uh, Joyce and Drew <laughs> on this one where I where I often find myself. Um, our standard uh, economic analysis tends to look at these as uh, mainly issues of um, uh, human capital and uh, 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 development, investment, uh, taxation, uh, these kinds of things, human capital, meaning education and, and training, uh, and tends to uh, miss a lot of the, the power aspects. Uh, uh, Joyce herself does not miss them, but our, our profession as a whole tends to concentrate on um, things that are sort of easily explainable with data and miss things like systematic sexism uh, and racism. Um, and then uh, if you talk about inequality in a larger global sense, uh, we tend to really miss uh, the issues of international uh, uh, power. I was doing some work on, on climate change and there's, there's this little thing that, that looks technical, something called technical called Nagishi weights to prevent capital flows between countries. What it means is uh, we want the, the rich countries to stay rich and the poor countries to stay poor um, through any adjustments to climate. Uh, we're gonna make sure that the, this global balance uh, doesn't shift. Um, so there are huge issues of uh, systematic power um, and abuse of power uh, that standard analysis simply doesn't get to. Um, on the other hand, I think that there, the, the, the part of this issue that I've taken on to work myself is that I find a lot of, of people who I think of as good hearted and wanting to do something about this, um, buying into a lot of myths uh, that prevent them seeing opportunities. For example, this myth uh, that care work doesn't need any resources, or this myth uh, that business and management uh, can be only about profit and not about uh, uh, people. Um, businesses are actually made up of people. They're actually part of a uh, society. Uh, uh, ec the economy is not something uh, off in some satellite sphere somewhere that is not subject to uh, social and ethical rules. So. Um, that, that's been my little, the little corner that I've been tugging at on a, a vast and complicated issue. Yeah, I, I have, well, I, for the past 15 years, I've been in an anthropology department and it's a complicated story. I came as a director and the economics department was like, no way, she's not a real economist. We're not gonna give her tenure. And the Women's and Gender Studies program uh, it is a program, not a department. So they weren't a tenure granting unit. At any rate, anthropology said, sure, we'd like to have her because we like her global focus and uh, her work on inequality. So, but I have over the 15 years become quite influenced by economic anthropology. And in particular, the work of people like uh, 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 David Graeber, the late David Graeber, and uh, whose death I mourn uh, so much. I mean, I read his book, uh, Debt, of uh, the first 5,000 years, and it changed my entire research trajectory. Uh, but one of the points he makes in this book is, again, as Julie said, common, common sense notions. And he begins the book with an anecdote of a conversation he had at a party in London with a woman, very well-intentioned woman, uh, talking about uh, a third world debt and uh, what to do about it. And he said, what to do about it? Get rid of it, abolish it, uh, wipe out debt, strike debt. And she looked at him and she said, but 
surely one must pay one's debts. And that was the spark for him to write that book, because as he pointed out, in actuality, if you think of who owes what to whom, the Global South does not owe us anything. We owe the Global South an enormous debt because without those Global South resources, the Industrial Revolution would never have happened. Without sugar from the Caribbean, cotton from the United States, uh, uh, just to name the two most prominent things, there are many others, but, uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, but I think I think those kind of common sense notions, particularly around debt, uh, surely one has to pay one's debts. Well, no, actually, not always. And 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 forcing uh, the global South to paying their debts is one of the things that has kept them impoverished all these years, and will also be a huge driver of anti climate change because it inhibits their ability to undertake what they need to take on to stop climate change. So I, I say debt is one of those huge factors and common sense notions about it. Thank you. Um, to continue that conversation, could any of you uh, explain what is the difference between gender equity, gender equality and women's empowerment? in regards to the economy. Oh, well, I can start on this one because I actually saw your questions and thought about it a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, the difference between gender equity and gender equality, that's pretty simple. Gender, ec gender equality means you give each group, say women and men, the same number of resources, the same rules, the same uh, 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 wages, et cetera, are available to both of these groups. However, the structural impediments to women's uh, participation in the labor force and uh, uh, things like that are not equal. And so if you have gender equality, but you don't have any changes in those structural things like protection for uh, reproductive rights and uh, the right to abortion and that sort of thing, then it's, it doesn't make any difference. And you might have all seen that meme where you have uh, two kids picking apples off a tree and they both have the same size ladders, but one of them is much shorter. So that's equality. Equity would give the, the, the person picking the, the short person a taller ladder. And so equity is a more complicated subject and needs to go further uh, uh, than equality. And then finally, with regards to women's empowerment, it is a concept I do not use. To me, it is smacks of neoliberalism. And it says, well, we're gonna give you the tools to make so you can better yourself. And I just, I don't like that neoliberal. I, I, I don't think it has any meaning and I don't like it. I think they're really interesting concrete versions of this that we think about all the time. And I appreciate Drew's distinction and, and I'm fine with also not trying to figure out what women's empowerment should be in this. I mean, a great example I think that has come up in my career is parental leaves versus um, mother's leaves or maternal leaves. And I think when I first started in the academy, we didn't have any leave at all. My first job, there was no parental leave of any type. So we just had to cover our own classes or hope we had a child during the summer, which luckily my first child was born right after exams ended. So I could take off the summer. And then she was old enough to go to daycare because the school didn't provide any leave. And my colleague who had her daughter during October had to hire someone to cover her class for the rest of the term. Uh, then the next school I went to, there was parental leave, and it was the same whether or not you were a man or a woman, and um, that was good because I did have a baby in October that year. They did let us choose whether we wanted to have one class and not lose any pay or no classes and lose some pay, and since I was new in my job, I chose the option of one class without losing pay, which meant I did have to find someone to watch my child uh, three days a week uh, after I had him. Um, and then about halfway through my time at that job at Westland, um, there was a movement among the younger faculty to switch to uh, a different leave structure where women would get longer leave than men. 
And the argument was that that was the equitable structure while the earlier structure was equal, but not equitable. Though perversely then it caused a, a sort of a, I think a problem in terms of thinking about when women got credit um, because they would still take it as a leave and wouldn't get credit towards um, their sabbaticals. So often when you're trying to set up either an equal system or an equitable system, there can be these weird other consequences that actually can unwork them. But for me, that was a very graphic example of the shift in how people were thinking about how to handle equality and equity and how it affected these leave structures in academia and other, other areas as well. I don't really have anything to add to what my colleagues have said. Thank you. Um, that's a really interesting example of how you've experienced different versions of uh, leave throughout your career, like in such a short period of time from um, no equality to equality to equity. Um, another question we have is how does economic gender inequality differ based on culture and location? I think we talked a little bit about it in the beginning, but if we could expand on that, that would be great. Could, could you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, so how does economic gender inequality differ based on culture and location? So more of the intersectionality part or like further from just being in America as a white woman? Um, well, we have, I, th th there are people who do a lot of the international comparisons. And if you look at industrialized countries, you know, Scandinavia is the big outlier <laughs> in creating, uh, you know, uh, long parental leaves, uh, use it or lose it um, leaves for uh, 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 male parents. Um, uh, a, a different attitude towards um, taking leave. Uh, I remember being in um, uh, Norway and somebody, uh, a, a man referred to his female colleague as having worked there for 12 years. She'd actually been on leave for something like six of those years having her kids, but she was still regarded as having uh, 12 years there. Um, that does have some, some downsides. The occupational segregation in um, places like Sweden and Norway can actually be more than in the US. That is, women are very well represented in things like governments and education and not very well represented at all in things like uh, uh, manufacturing. Um, and then you get you know, uh, uh, countries in which there may be, say, equality in terms of um, access to uh, 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 parental leave, but it only covers a very small part of the workforce that is formal, you know, or there may be anti-discrimination laws, but they only cover certain kinds of waged work and, you know, most of the, uh, most women and men work in less formal sorts of employment. So then you get, you know, very different uh, patterns coming out. I mean, there really is a, <laughs> a, a real extreme here, uh, country by country, and even within a region, uh, you get these variations. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is that class differences matter a lot. And so um, in some countries that are sort of lower income countries, you could still have a phenomenon where there are some very highly educated women who participate very fully. And so they tend to be the upper, in upper class women um, actually could be relatively equal to men and often are involved in government, et cetera. But then there's a big difference um, when you get down to the lower income sector in terms of where you see women and men and the different levels of education. So I think class is another way we hadn't talked about as much earlier and thinking about the way these various segregation aspects cut across. And so being a high income woman versus a low income woman could be a very different experience. I would say probably more so in other countries more than in the US um, where women tend to work more in all the, all the class levels in the US more than in some other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think when we think about cultural differences, uh, we have to be really careful about the assumptions we make. And for example, one kind of common sense assumption is that women in Islamic countries are more oppressed than women in uh, Western countries, and that the hijab is a symbol of, only a symbol of oppression. Now, I don't want to get into a, a, a debate about the hijab, because that's that's going way far away from economics, And uh, but nevertheless, 
uh, when you kind of look at, at the Islamic countries and, and women's participation in the labor force, you often get much different uh, results. And one of the things, uh, one of the results is there's a lot more homework in uh, uh, low income uh, Islamic countries. That is to say work that is done for profit to sell, but is done in the home. And so it is, uh, uh, it is uh, consistent with uh, uh, their gender laws and their gender customs and that sort of thing. Or when you look at countries like Egypt, that's a very interesting example, particularly with regards to the hijab, because one of the reasons as that has been hypothesized that women in Egypt took up the hijab with such uh, of rigor and vigor and enthusiasm, uh, not all of them, but some of them, was they, uh, if they were in the lower classes, in the working classes, they had to go to work in the factories. Egypt had to participate in the international economy in this way. And that meant, well, being outside the home, giving up that status of being in the home, et cetera, et cetera. And so taking up the hijab was a sign of, no, I am not giving up my status as a woman. I am protecting it with the hijab. I'm a respectable woman. Uh, uh, I am still a respectable Muslim woman. You also find this in Indonesia. So I think as Western feminists uh, and Western feminists in, in all the disciplines that have international connections, we need to really look at cultures very carefully and try to be self-reflective as to what our assumptions are and particularly around uh, Islam, but, but in other cultures as well. Thank you. I think um, also we're gonna do two more questions then head to the Q&A section. Um, so my first question is, uh, how has the pandemic affected the economy in regards to women? I, I think it's been very hard on women, partly because of the caring aspect and the fact that the school system in many places basically broke down. Um, sometimes people didn't want to send their children into school. Sometimes they didn't have the option. Um, daycare has also been harder to get during the pandemic. Many daycares closed down. And so many women have not returned to the labor force at this point. Um, so it's given that they have often had primary requir requirement for taking care of children, it has affected them a lot. It set us back years, in my view, um, where the labor force participation rate had been rising for women, and now it has, has dropped back down. Um, so it's been very, very difficult. Also, obviously, many professions that women are in, like nursing, uh, other sort of customer facing uh, professions have been hit hard. And so it's been a very challenging period. That's not to say it hasn't been challenging for men as well, but there are specific aspects related to household structure that have made it very difficult for women. Do you want to go, Julie? Um, I don't. I don't have a lot to add. I just know that uh, I'm, I was particularly struck by some statistics. Um, I guess it was during the first year of the pandemic uh, that when um, uh, September came and schools got started again, huge drop in in women's employment and women's labor force participation. It was something like you know seventy or eighty percent of the people who left their jobs, uh, you know, right as school started, uh, were women. Yeah, I, I agree with what both of my colleagues have said. In addition, I would say that um, uh, it, even the, uh, uh, the supports that we had before the pandemic, particularly with the transnational labor, the transnational market for uh, care labor, nursing, child care, et cetera, that broke down because uh, we could no longer travel from country to country. And so uh, all of a sudden you had middle-class women and upper middle-class women who they were the ones responsible for these children. And uh, I have, obviously I'm well past my childbearing years now, but I have several friends who have children and it was a, a real struggle for them. And even they, all of them that I know have very caring and attentive husbands. But nevertheless, the reality is 
the, the burden fell on them to try to keep their career together. And this was academia, so it was a lot easier. It wasn't like being a bank manager or something. Uh, but but uh, the stress that it put on women was just astonishing, no matter which class you were in. And part of this, the stress, because the, the structures of, of, of childcare all of a sudden fell apart. The schools were closed, international travel was closed, daycare centers were closed. I mean, it shoved everything back into the private familial unit and therefore on the burden, I mean, on the shoulders of women in that unit. And it, 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 if, if you look at other indicators of COVID, not just gender indicators, I was looking at the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals recently for class I'm teaching. And oh my gosh, they, um, goals that were, you know, had rising indicators now are all going negative and it's all because of COVID. So it had a devastating impact on women. Yeah, I had personally not even heard of the term care economics or like a care economy until this past year in college. So thank you for illustrating the effects of the, uh, the pandemic on especially the care economy. Yeah. And then our final question is more of a personal one, but uh, what difficulties have you all faced as women in economics? Um, and do you think that the field has become more inclusive? I'll let the other two go because they've had more conventional economics careers than I have. <laughs> yeah, I had, um... Uh, as I said, I, I didn't think anybody would uh, believe me unless I had all the economics credentials. Um, uh, it turns out some people uh, don't accept uh, uh, feminist economists, even when they do have all the academic credentials. So I had had uh, tenure at University of California, Davis. I came to another uh, eminent Boston area uh, institution, uh, Brandeis University. Um, as an associate professor uh, untenured, uh, and even though it was a much lower ranking school, ended up being denied tenure there. Um, I got a probable cause finding from Massachusetts Commission on uh, Discrimination. Um, but there was, I, th I think when they hired me, they thought I did kind of an add women and stir sort of thing using uh, you know, main mainstream work to look at women's issues. Uh, and I did some of that, but I also did um, some real critique of why uh, we think that uh, math is so much important than, uh, important than words, self-interest so much more important than interdependence, et cetera, uh, and they could not abide that. Um, I did eventually land uh, at UMass Boston, which was a wonderful place in the sense that you could not tell the students and the faculty from the food service workers, so it was good that way. Um, but it was not, you know, clearly not as prestigious as some of the other places I had been, uh, but I have no regrets. Um, in, uh, in my career. I also, um, actually the, the year after I, uh, uh, the, when I left Brandeis, I actually went to UMass Boston for a year and then to Harvard for a year on a fellowship and also have done some teaching there. So it's, it's been a very mixed career, um, uh, but I have no regrets about, uh, about choosing it. It's funny because I think both Julie and I recently were asked to write essays for a book about second wave feminists in the social sciences. So it was the first time I'd really sat down and kind of gone back over and thought about what happened when. And a lot of when I um, came along. It was right when things were opening up more for women. Um, when I started in college, it was the first year that admissions had been gender blind, for instance, at the college. <coughs> so I feel like I've had a little easier path um, by just coming along a little later. But I think the question about inclusivity is interesting. I think in some ways the field is less inclusive, frankly. Um, I feel like it's gotten a little more, um, even though we have an area of feminist economics now, it's almost like I don't want to say it's a ghetto, but there's a little bit of pigeonholing of people into areas that bothers me. Um, and I, I actually worry that it's less inclusive because of that. Yeah, I, I agree with what both of my colleagues have just said. And, but I want to add that I actually think I benefited from being a woman when I applied to graduate school. I was not an econ major as an undergraduate. I was a philosophy major. And that's really what I wanted to do was philosophy. 
Um, but as I said, I wanted a job and I didn't think I was going to be able to get a job in philosophy. That was the beginning of the real tightening of uh, careers in the humanities in general and the changes in the university. But at that time, I think economics departments wanted uh, particularly American women to diversify their student body and ultimately their faculty. And it was partly a racist move. They didn't want, they, they were being harder on applicants from Asia who had mathematical skills to beat the band, um, but they, they really wanted to sort of change that face of economics. And so they accepted me as a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana with a, you know, a, a fairly nice uh, package. And then uh, I was able to teach as an instructor at Illinois State. And uh, so it really helped me then. Uh, the only time it really hurt me was when I went from Holland's University, a small women's liberal arts college in Virginia, to the University of South Carolina to be the director of women's studies. Um, it hurt me then because the economics department, they wouldn't even, I had just published the first edition of Liberating. I, it had gotten really good reviews. I had a couple of, of good articles out, one in Signs, one in Frontiers, et cetera. They wouldn't even look at that stuff. They just said, that's not economics. We won't have anything to do with her. And that's when I went into anthropology. Now, ultimately, that was a gift to me. I have benefited so much intellectually from my uh, affiliation with uh, anthropology and particularly my delving into economic anthropology and my wonderful colleagues here at the university. What I've given up, however, is the title Professor of Economics. And I was a professor of economics when I went on the market. I had gotten uh, uh, promoted at when I was at Hollins. And so <clears throat> like recently I've been working on a uh, living wage campaign for our union here, Campus Workers United. And I've written some stuff for them to use. And uh, I just, it kills me that I can't write. Drusilla K. Barker, Professor of Economics, because that has far more prestige than Drusilla K. Barker, Professor of Anthropology. And that I do regret. Well, I don't regret it. It just makes me sad that it had to happen. I wouldn't change it. I, I mean, I would, I would make the same decision again in a heartbeat. It was a good decision, but I just feel that I really lost something when I could no longer say I was a professor of economics. And I begged the dean, couldn't we make an exception for me or something? And she said, absolutely not, Drew. <laughs> You're I think that it's so telling. That's so telling also that you are saying that professor of anthropology is not as high status as professor of economics and it's what that not. says about academia. I mean, it's just not. And and I, uh, I, I, I have volunteered to work on campaigns, political campaigns here and stuff, and and, and I do, but I know that I, 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 I that I would have much more recognition and respect if I were a professor of economics. That's just that's just the facts of the world. Anthropology, bleh, what is that about? No one even knows what anthropology is usually even though it's a really wonderful social science. Thank you so much for all of your insights on both the field and your personal experiences. Uh, we don't have time for a very long Q&A, but I do have two questions. Uh, if I, any of you guys feel as though you want to answer, you don't have to all answer. Uh, the first question is based on your experience in research, is there any way to undo sex segregation in the US and abroad in your personal opinion? I don't think it's going to happen in my, my lifetime. I think there are very deep forces. I talk about it a lot in my first book on economics of gender. It often reappears in other forms. So it, it seems to be a very fundamental aspect of human organization. I, I just don't know if we can actually ever eradicate it. Um, 
I, I, I think that, <laughs> that Joyce is right about that. On the other hand, I also have to say that I have seen changes uh, in my lifetime. I remember a, an exchange when I was an undergraduate majoring in economics with uh, a middle-aged woman who asked me what I was in. And uh, I said, economics. And she said, um, oh, home economics, how nice. You know? <laughs> and <laughs> um, and this, was, this was pretty standard at the time. Uh, I also remember hearing when I was first studying gender and economics, this was in the you know, 1970s, uh, that women were not in fields like law or business simply because they weren't interested or were capable. Uh, funny how anti-discrimination law, suddenly all of these women become interested and capable who were not you know, there before. So there have been you know, very large inroads in some areas. Uh, in some cases, it's actually tipped. Uh, now uh, a pharmacy, uh, uh, being a pharmacist is now a female dominated, has gone from male dominated to female dominated. So in, in a sense, segregation in the other direction. Um, but yeah, it's a... Um, there's, you know, there, you can do a long treatise on this. There's rules, you know, there's rules for legislation. There's rules for role modeling. There's, um, you know, there's, ro sorry, roles for all of those things in creating um, this kind of change. Uh, but it's a, an uphill battle. People have, um, are very territorial <laughs> and have a lot of their identity tied up with their work and uh, 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 identities and don't particularly like these sorts of changes. Yeah, I agree with both of you. And I just want to add what the uh, great late Barbara, Barbara Bergman said, which is that uh, 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 sex segregation benefits men and they don't want to give up that benefit. They don't want they don't want their their professions to become feminized. They're perfectly happy with things the way they are for the most part. And I think she was right. I thought she was right then. I think she's right today. Thank you. And then the last question that we have time for is, how uh, does the economy and labor markets shape households? That's a huge question that would take like another two hours. <laughs> I mean, I think we've indicated some ways that we've indicated a lot about, as you point out, that households shape labor markets, but labor markets clearly shape households, partly because men and women make different amounts of earnings, and that goes back and affects the power relationships within the household. I think I'll just leave it at that small point for this, since we're running low on time. I'll just point to um, a phrase that I, I really like, uh, used to teach my, my gender and economics courses coming from Joan Williams, that were set up, um, a lot of the, the work structure, employment structure in the US is set up to be jobs with wives. That is, the jobs are assumed to have somebody else taking care of the stuff at home. So you can work late, so you can travel, so you can, you know, you have to be 100% on the job. And if you're not able to do that, you're put into some kind of slow tier, slow, slow road sort of thing. Uh, it doesn't need to be that way. She also called, you know, she also calls us the problem of 13 eggs. You know, if you go to the store and you want 13 eggs, you've got to buy two dozen because they don't come in packs of 13. Um, well, we have more and more workers that are more like 13 eggs than like 12, right? Um, more and more people that have, uh, you know, elderly dependents, children at home, um, you know, as women have, have come into the labor force. So why we keep um, structuring a lot of our jobs and structuring our public policies around the idea uh, that people don't need, um, don't have these other responsibilities um, is, is insane. <laughs> Yeah, and the economy has really always kind of shaped the uh, structure of the family. I mean, when we went in the United States from an agrarian economy with sort of the yeoman farmer who had all the people be beneath him to a wage labor system, that really changed the, the whole structure of the family as well. And uh, uh, these various economic changes always profoundly affect the structure of the economy and they always will. And so I think we have to always take into account that relationship between economic structures and institutions and familial structures and institutions. The, you can't explain the nuclear family by itself. You have to include what were the economic conditions that led to the nuclear family and to the breakdown of the extended family, for example. And this is very specifically about the United States. 
Thank you. And uh, this is all the time that we have. But again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your days to come to speak at our panel. Um, and yeah. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye bye. It was a lot of fun, you guys. <laughs>